Turn your Bibles, please. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to be finishing up chapter 9. Get your Bibles open to there. The Word of God is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. You want verses to speak to you, you got to read it, right? And basically, my pastor used to tell me, he says, Dennis, you want God to speak to you, you got to read his Word. You know, you're not going to read his mind, thank God. <laughs> he says, you got to read his Word. So put your Bibles in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I love this area of Scripture, guys. The end of chapter 9 is one of my total favorite areas. Why? Because it calls on all to minister to all with no bias. Absolutely no bias. It's a call by Paul to the Corinthians there to reach out to the lost, to reach out to them in all ways, right? But how mainly? Through the gospel. That's what Paul's telling them, through the gospel. And the gospel, as we well know, the gospel of Jesus is for all mankind, every man, woman, and child. Jesus called Paul to what? Preach the gospel. And that's what Paul was going to do. Come hell or high water, Paul is going to preach the gospel, right? Leave no one out, too. Leave no one out. Preach to the, as the title's going to be a little bit here, whosoever's. Right? Those whosoever's out there, reach the lost and show God to them. You know, John 3.16 speaks of the whosoever's. The way I like to read it, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him, those whosoever's out there that believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The whosoever's, no soul left out. Reach them all for God. Paul's going to tell Corinth. Find a niche, church. Much of reaching people for the Lord is to find a niche. Many times, put yourself in their shoes. You know, put down your religion and pick up Jesus Christ, that simple gospel, right? You know, put down the religion and that look, even if it's a religious look, and just pick up Jesus Christ. Find that niche and put yourself in their their shoes, and then just reach them out. Reach out to them with a simple, simple gospel. Guys, salvation can only come through the gospel. Do we understand that? You can't save somebody. I can't save somebody. Boy, I'd like to sometimes. You know, I would love to just have that little pill I could throw in that person's mouth. Man, you are saved now, you know? No, it comes through the gospel, and it's the gospel shared. It actually is the power of God the gospel is. Romans 1.16, Paul said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Church, please, never be ashamed of what God has done in your life, your, the gospel of Jesus, the truth. Just don't be ashamed of it. He says, No, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is what? The power of God to salvation. This is why Paul said, I is, I'm not ashamed. It is the power of God to salvation. To everyone who believes, the whosoever's, there again, the whosoever's. For the Jew first and also the Greek. Of course, he was speaking to his time. But he's speaking the whosoever's. And the gospel, that is the power unto salvation. We must always understand that. The gospel of truth that changes a man and changed a man like me. Like me. 29 years, 28 years ago, God entered my life and changed me through what? The gospel? Through something I did? No. You know, he changed me through the gospel. That's the only way he could change me is that way. You know, the commission is actually given to every Christian to share the gospel. To every believer, not just the pastors. Oh, Pastor Jesse, that's your job. Or, you know, Rick, that's your job. That's your job, Pastor Dennis, you know. No, it's given to everybody, that commission, to reach the lost. Matthew 28, 19. Jesus said... Go, therefore. Do we all understand the word go? You know, you used to say, do you, what, what don't you understand about no? Well, what don't you understand about go? You got to get out of, your, out of your house. Maybe you got to get out of your chair. Wherever it is, go, therefore, and now make these disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go, therefore, is a command. It's not some kind of a suggestion. It's not some kind of a polite request. Jesus said, Go. Therefore, right? If you're going to tell somebody to get, would you just go? Yeah, that's not a, you know, that's not a uh, polite request. Maybe we should be that way more. But. <laughs> and 
And not only that, that command is actually a mission. And for many, you may think it's a mission impossible, right? <laughs> well, it is. For many, it seems like it. But Jesus says, still go to the whosoever. It may seem like a mission impossible. Reach the lost. Reach the whosoever. Wherever they are and however you find them. See, guys, a lot of times we don't want to reach the lost because we might find them in a place that, oh, just detests us, you know? Oh, we look down on them, wherever they are. Sometimes you got to go places where, whoo, man, take some boldness just to step into that yard, right? I always tell you, when I pull into somebody's place, whether I know them or don't know them in the Hoyt down here, and I pull in there, I honk my horn twice, just beep, beep, they know I'm there. I can tell you this, I have never been shot. <laughs> Nobody's ever brought a gun out and went, okay, what are you doing? You know, you got to reach them where they're at. The Great Commission also, it's not hard and should never be hard for you. It's not burdensome. It's not out of any Christian's reach. The only requirement to perform, I guess, that mission that Jesus gave you, to share the gospel, is a heart of love and a care for others. A care for others more than yourself and a heart to serve Jesus that way. God has given you all you need, and God will continue to give you all you need. He's given you first that heart as he changed you. He gave you a heart, gives you a mind, right? He's given you a mouth to speak it with, and then a mission to go on. It may seem impossible to you, but it's not for God. And then go, he says, go therefore, Jesus did. Now today, as we get into this message, Paul's going to speak about his method, and I think it's a really good thing to study. Like I say, I, that's why it's my favorite area, one of my favorite areas. It's how to reach those, right? The whosoever. And he's going to share his method in it. Number one, I want to say, he says, not in these words, but be real. Can you be real, right? Can you be real? And, and then meet people where they're at as you're being real. Those whosoever's. Our people too, church. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you, Lord. Father, as I teach this message, Father. I believe, God, you have got a message for us here, for our community, through this church, here in Peoples Valley and Kirkland and all the surrounding area, to reach out to these whosoever's, Lord. Father, teach us to do so through the words of Paul. In Jesus' name, amen. So the title of my message, if you don't have it yet, is Whosoever's, okay? <laughs> That's a neat play on words there, actually. Whosoever is actually an old word. It is an old word, and it's in the dictionary. I couldn't find it with the S on there. So I asked my wife, I said, well, should there be apostrophe S? She, she says, no, that's possessive, right? If you need to learn English or form a, a grammar, talk to Kathy back there, talk to my wife, or talk to Debbie, you know, these ones who know proper grammar. Anyway, going back from that. Now, going back a little, I want to step us back a little before we get into this verses right here we're studying. Earlier, way back in chapter 8, which was, I don't know, a month or so or two months ago, Paul spoke about giving up his rights on something, guys. He gave up his rights, and he said, I give up my rights of my own needs, and those things maybe my own desires would be. He gave up, you know, those things that my flesh wants, and I'm giving them up for a reason. I give them up, he says, basically for the gospel's sake. Uh, and it started, this whole thing, where he sees rights he gives up, started with their question on eating of meat in their time, and during the, those, that meat was a sacrifice to idols. And, and he went on from there. But he gave, we brought it into a lot of different areas in our lives, right? Look at uh, verse, chapter 8, verse 13, where Paul said, he gave up a right. He says, therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Boy, if that isn't the ultimate of love, Right? I'll just give it up. I'll give up that right. Why? For my brother. Paul had the right to do what he needed to do, but he would not cause his brother to stumble. Jesus was more important, and the gospel was more important. 
Others become more important, you see, when Jesus becomes more important in our lives and the gospel becomes more important. Others will become more important. Guys, turn your Bibles, please, to Philippians. I really got you in Corinthians. Just go to Philippians chapter 2. This area of Scripture here in chapter 2, I believe, is the mark of a Christian. And basically, put in a nutshell, it's putting others before yourself, right? Jesus says, put others before yourself. <clears throat> Excuse me, Paul in Corinthians basically writes the same thing. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. He says, therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and any mercy, fulfill my joy, he says, by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Unity, right? Unity in Jesus. Letting nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Lift them up. Edify them. They are, you know, think about it. If every person in this church lifted up the other one higher than themselves, we'd all be on a pedestal, right? We'd all be up there. Not that you're putting them on a pedestal. Esteem others. He says, let each of you, in verse 4, let each of you look out not only for your own interests, me, 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 you know, Mine, mine, mine. <laughs> if you ever, you got to watch those little kid movies, you know, Finding Nebo. Mine, mine, mine. Let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, Paul writes, which was also in Christ Jesus. He says there, let this mind be in you. That in Christ Jesus. Esteem others. Give up the right of you being number one. Amen. Basically, that's what it is. Esteem others and lift up many times the whosoever's, guys. You know, encourage them. It's a mark of a Christian. Now, Paul also spoke about, in chapter 9, he gave up another right. And I went through that. And, um, he basically gave up the right of financial support from the Corinth church. There was a struggle there. And he says, that's no struggle. I'm still going to preach the gospel. I care less if I get this. By the way, note, this was his right for the church to help support him, but he didn't need to have that, you know? He decided, no, I'll give that up. Why? So the gospel wouldn't be hindered, that's it. But it was his right, and it was, and it was Barnabas' right. Many others were supported in Corinth. Look at chapter 9, verse 12. He gave up that right. He says there, if others are partakers of this right, he's speaking about that Basically, financial, uh, providing food for them, lodging, those kind of things. If others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? He's speaking about himself and Barnabas. Nevertheless, we have not used this right. Why? But ha uh, having, I'm sorry, uh, but endure all things, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. He gave it up that he did not hinder the gospel of Christ. He did it for Jesus' sake, not his own. He gave it up for the whosoevers that he could reach, right? He gave it up for them. And that the gospel would not be hindered by anything. That's a great heart. Now, Paul, he's going to write about who kind of the whosoevers are, right? He's going to write about that. Who are these whosoevers out there? And how do you reach them? He's going to give us... Really good information on how to do that. And it starts, guys, with being a servant. It starts with being a servant. And then he ends by uh, the fact that you cannot compromise your own witness. If you want to reach the whosoevers, your life has to be in line with Jesus' word. And he's going to say that. Not to compromise that witness of yours. In verse 19, let's read there, beginning there, where we left off last two weeks ago. For though I am free from all men, he says, though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all. In true translation, he actually says a slave to all. Boy, nobody likes that word slave anymore. Jesus says, you need to be a slave unto me, a doulos. I'm a slave unto my Lord. 
right? For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant of all, that I might win the more, he says. And to the Jew I have become a Jew, that I might win Jews to those who are under the law. Under the law of Moses, okay, the Old Testament. Um, to those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, not outlaws, but those basically the Gentiles, uh, as without law, not being without law. And you notice that in parentheses? Is that in parentheses on your Bible? We're going to come back to that. He says they're not, uh, but, uh, let me get that. Not being without law toward God, but under law towards Christ, that I might win those who are now without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do, all as he speaks about, this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be a partaker of it now with you, he states. Now he starts there with saying, being this servant of all. Basically serving the whosoevers, to win the whosoever. He starts there. In verse 19, he says, for though I am free, we're going to go into that. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant at all, a servant to all, that I might win the more. He says it starts with being a servant. If you want to win the whosoevers, you've got to be willing to serve. You got to maybe be willing to get down in the, well, in the ditches a little bit, I want to say. You might have to be willing to freely give of yourself. Who's more important? And were you? Well, you're not going to be that servant. I can tell you, if you're top of the list on your concerns, you will not be a servant to Jesus. In verse 19, he says there, for though I am free, he says, from all men. He's speaking he's free from men. I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. What is Paul saying when he says, though I am free? What is he saying that? Free from all men. Paul was not bound by men. He was bound by duty to his Lord Jesus Christ, but he wasn't bound by men at all. Not at all. He was free to live for himself. He could have went out and done whatever he wanted. He didn't have to preach the gospel. He was bound to Jesus, but he was not bound to men. He was free to do his own thing, just as we all are, church. We're all free just to do our own thing in Christ. You're saved. Praise the Lord. You got your fire insurance. You're free to do whatever you want. Free to say, you know, basically Paul could have said, well, I got mine. I have mine. I'm good to go. I'm saved. Sucks to be you, right? That's kind of the attitude sometimes. That's kind of the attitude where people, well, I got mine, I'm saved, I'm good with Christ. Is that your attitude? Right? I hope it's not. Um, you know, you're good, life's good for me, all's good, to heck with the world, to heck with the rest of the hoid out here, to heck with down there in Yarnell, those people that are suffering, those people that are lonely, those people that are downtrodden, those, uh, I'm good, I'm good. And guess what, I can come into the church, I got great coffee here, and I got my family around me. You know, I'm good. The heck with the rest of them. Well, if that is you, all right, I'm not accusing anybody, but if it is you, please, would you pay attention, close attention to this message. I pray it will wake you up. In verse 19, he says, For though I am free from all men, I made myself a servant of all, that I might win the more. Yes, Paul says, yes, I'm free, but I choose to be a servant. I choose to do this. Why? That I might win these whosoevers out there. And he's going to get into that. Win these whosoevers. More and more and more of them. I choose others first, he says, to win for my Jesus. Church, there really shouldn't be no greater goal or greater desire of a Christian to see salvation than to see salvation in whosoevers out there. Those who are lost, it should be your greatest desire, no greater purpose, no greater calling, no greater joy. There's no greater reward 
You know, we, the Bible tells us we'll all stand before Christ in that day and give account for what we did in the body, whether good or bad. It's called the Bema Seat of Christ. Do you want to be able to stand there and, and Jesus be able to say, well done, good and faithful servant? You know, I imagine this. I sure it's not this way. Number one, we don't know how long that's going to be, right? We're there for eternity, so, hey, Josh, he may spend six weeks with you showing you your life. We're in no hurry, right? I don't know about six weeks, but anyway. Probably six months for you, Josh. All the bad, right? No, no. But think about this. I think about it this way. Man, I'd be standing there with my Lord. By the way, when you're there, you're saved. You're not under judgment. You're saved. And he says, well done. Well done, Dennis. Let me show you those. Every life that I touched in one way. Maybe just planted a seed maybe preach the gospel to, maybe said the sinner's prayer with. Oh, wow. That would be the greatest thing in the world. I pray those, the bad, isn't shown there, obviously, right? But anyway, there should be no greater desire. No greater reward. You know? What would you pay if you could? Think about it. If you could reach into your pocket, you could get out your money, and you could do, deal it out, and you could say, hmm, I can get my granddaughter saved if I put this much in. Or I can get my, my you know, brother, my mother, my father, whomever it is. What would you pay to see others saved, right? Family, friends, loved ones. Maybe just a neighbor that you really care about. What would you pay? How do we do this? Right? Because obviously we cannot buy salvation. Never will be able to. Like I say, if I could do that, man, I would, I'd take out some big old loans and start paying, you know, for their salvation. But how do we do it? We start it with a servant's heart, you see. When we have a servant's heart, put down the right to self, as Paul says, then relate to them and walk in their shoes. Be real, church. If you get nothing else out of this message, please learn to be real. Guess what? Chances are you were there in their shoes at one time. I was there in many shoes, all right? How can I relate? How can I speak to him in a heart of love? Because I was there. I was in that pit, that miry pit of sin. Go on to verse 20 here. We'll never get through here. And to the Jews, he said, I became as a Jew, that I might win the Jews. Paul was a Jew at one time. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He says, that I might win the Jews to those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who now are under the law, he says there. Now, to the outside observer during Paul's time, uh, they thought Paul was very inconsistent with his walk because the way he would reach people there. He looked like he swayed his convictions to and fro in different areas. In Acts 21, if you want to turn your Bibles, please, to Acts 21, we're just going to read a little bit there. It tells the story of Paul where he was basically, uh, though he was saved and though he was saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, he performed along with these other Jews a, um, a ritual. It was called the Nazarite ritual. But he did this. And so many said, wow, you go, you go, I hate to use the word both ways, right? But you go always, always. How's that? Uh, knowing he did not have to do this because he was under the new covenant of Jesus. But Paul wanted to win Jews, and so in Acts 21, it says there, let's jump down to, uh, now let's just read from verse 15. And after those days, we packed and went into Jerusalem. Also, some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought with them a certain uh, nation of Cyprus, who, uh, a, an earlier disciple with whom we were lodged. And when we had come to the Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And on the following day, Paul went in with us, uh, to James, one of the disciples, and all the elders were present. And when he had greeted them, he told in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. He'd been on these missionary journeys. Many, many Gentiles, unbelievers, ungodly people, the whosoever's, being saved through this time. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. And they said to him, hey, but you see, brother, how many midrids 
of Jews, how multitude of them, there are who have believed, and they are, now they're zealous for the law, though, uh, but they have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews among you, among the Gentiles, to forsake Moses. He wasn't doing that. He was preaching the blood of Christ, the gospel, saying that they ought not to be circumcised. Yeah, that was a Mosaic law, to be circumcised. They not to have to be circumcised, their children, nor to walk according to the customs. What then, they asked him. Uh, he said, the assembly went and, and uh, certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. We've got to do something, Paul. What's going on here? Therefore, do you want to uh, uh, do what we tell you? We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them and pay their, their expenses and basically go through this entire Nazarite ritual. Go on to verse 26. Then Paul took the men the next day, having been purified with them. He went through it, and he entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification. Now, Paul did this. Paul did this, though he was free from that law, which he was. Why? Because he chose others over himself. He wanted to reach the Jews, you see. Just like he said in, in Corinthians there. I want to be a Jew to the Jew. I want to be weak to the weak. He had Timothy, his understudy, young Timothy, circumcised, knowing that Timothy didn't need to be circumcised. It was not necessary for any type of salvation, but he had Timothy circumcised because then Timothy could minister to the Jews. He did it solely for the gospel's sake. The Jews would respect Timothy because of this, and he didn't know who he'd be ministering to. You know, I got a commentator by the name of Smith, he says, Paul sought to win people to Jesus Christ by being sensitive to their needs and identifying with them. Think about that, guys. You want to win people to Jesus Christ, be sensitive to their needs and identify with them. We should try to reach people where they are today, he says, and then expect to see the changes later. Reach them where they are today. Let God do the work from there. You don't save them. God and the Holy Spirit can do the work. It's okay. Wait and see the changes later. In verse 21, we read there. To those who are without law, those who are the Gentiles, you know, the heathens out there, without law, not, uh, he, he preaches them. To those who are without law, as without law, he says. Now, there's a very important note here if you see it in the parentheses. Not being without law towards God, but under the law towards Christ that I might win those who now are without law. What's Paul saying here? Well, again, he's adjusting to the situation for the Gentiles, for the heathens out there. He would reach them where they're at. The whosoever's, wherever they are, he would go out and reach them. It's important to note what's in those parentheses. Paul's not saying he would suffer his own witness to do so. You understand what I'm saying? He would be under the law of Christ anyway. You don't go out and witness to somebody and just be like them. Well, I'm going to be, a, I can come to you and I can be like you and we can sit down together and smoke a bowl and then I'll tell you about Jesus. No, you can't suffer your witness. If that person's smoking a bowl, it's okay. Watch for the change later, right? You cannot suffer your own witness, church, and that's what he's saying there. You have to reach the whosoever's where they are sometimes. Not, though, being part of the world. You're separate from the world, right? Jesus says we're separate. Not conforming to the whosoever ways. You know, years ago, a guy came to me. I was at Calvary Prescott, and, and he's, he's, you know, a, not a real mature Christian. He had about four years, and he had some sobriety on him, too. Had been an alcoholic, and his heart was towards those where he had come from, the bars and everything. And he told me, you know, Dennis, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna go preach in the bars, you know. I'm gonna go sit down alongside him. I'm gonna tell him about Jesus. And I said, dude, yeah, that don't work. You're walking into that environment. I said, you don't need to be there. You know, well, you know, I could just have one beer today and I'd be okay. So you're gonna pull up a beer and now you're gonna. I said that will not work. I said instead, why don't you do this? Wait until they walk out of the bar, stumble over the, you know, the doorstep and fall flat in their face in the gutter and are puking. Now go tell them about Jesus, okay? 
That's the place to meet them. Guys, there's wrong ways to witness Christ. Always remember that. You know, it's not about being old fuddy-duddy and religious and beat them with a Bible, but it is your own witness, too. There's wrong ways to share Jesus. I have told some, literally, don't you, don't you witness of your Lord because your life does not add up to it. If you're living in some kind of a, 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 a lifestyle of sin, and I'll tell you where it happens most. It happens most where two are living together, right? They're living together and they're playing house. And, oh, I'm on fire for the Lord, and I'm going to put on this. I'm going to tell everybody about Jesus. And, buddy, we need to get you married first. You don't go out there and witness Christ and be in a sin anyway, whatever the sin may be. Anyway, there's wrong way to witness. Mm. Verse 22. To the weak, he says, I become as weak that I might win the weak. You guys know some weak? I was weak. I was really weak one time. Do you know some weak? Well, put a little weakness on, right? To the weak, I became weak that I might win this week. I become all things to all men that I might by all means save some, he said. I become all things to all men by all means that I might lead them into salvation. I may introduce them to Jesus. To the weak, I'll be weak. You got to be relative to their lives, okay? Relative. You're not weak maybe where they're trapped at, but you can be, relate to it. And many times, because you've been there, you care about the circumstances of their life. You truly care about them. You know, there's a quote by Warren Wiersbe, which I love a lot. It said, methods are many, principles are few. Methods can always change, principles never do. This is what Paul is saying. There's many, many ways to reach somebody. Methods can be many, principles are few. It's the Word of God. You don't go outside of the Word of God. Methods can be many. Take, for instance, going down to a skate park. You know, I've been with the young guy. He's all tatted up, man. He's got nose rings and all sorts of stuff. We're on skateboards, and kids are flocking to him. Now, he struggled with preaching the gospel, but guess what? He was a great hook for me to fish these kids in, and now I get to start telling them about Jesus, you know. I don't look that great at a skate park, guys, you know. Methods can be many. But see, the principles, you gotta, you gotta, you, you can't disqualify yourself, which he's going to say here, by your witness. See, the whosoever's will be put right in your path. Many times they're put there. Why? Because you can relate to them. You think God brings you somebody you can't relate to? No, he puts those persons that you can relate to. And then God gives you that opportunity, right? And he gives you that, I call it a divine opportunity. And I miss too many of them. I can tell you what. Put right in my face, you know. And I'm going later, oh, man. I could have just took a little more time with this person. He gives you those opportunities. And God gives, should have given you the heart for the whosoever. You know, my brother Josh down here, I'm always picking on him. He calls me the other night, and he saw a friend he hadn't seen for years and years and years. And they used to hang and do the thing, right? And do what they did together. And, and he's talking to this guy, and the guy's just, he's just, you know, down like this. He's weak. And asking Josh how he did it. And he says, this may sound odd to you, he says, but God did it. Let me tell you about God, he's telling him, you know. Amen. And the guy goes, well, is God real? And Josh is going, yeah, yeah. Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about my Jesus, right? You don't have to be a, a biblical scholar to tell what God has done in your lives. But it starts with your own relationship, I want to tell you, your own relationship with the Lord. Then it will move to the ears of the whosoever's and actually touch their hearts. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your heart first. Know your Lord and Savior. I know that I know that I know I'm saved. I know that Jesus died upon a cross for me. I know that God sent his only begotten son for me, that I would have eternal life. Know that you know that you know. And then always be ready to give a defense. That's actually an answer, guys. To give an answer to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that's in you. Josh did it. And what do you do it with? Meekness and fear. He did it with meekness and fear. Give an answer. Give the reason there, right? Why am I here? Why did God just happen to put you together at a mini-mart at that particular moment? 
I'll guarantee you, God was involved in that. Show them the hope you have in Christ. Humbly, with love. Guys, whosoever can sense a lie, I can tell you this. They're not stupid. They can sense a lie. Is Jesus truly your Lord? Is he truly your Lord, church? It will show in your life. And if he's not, the whosoever will know it. And you're doing no good out there. In verse 23, he says there, Now, uh, now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be a partaker of it with you. What a great joy he would have. I do it for the gospel's sake. Why? I do it for your sake. Why? That you can be partakers with me. That, man, we can come together as brothers in the Lord, sisters in the Lord, that we can worship the same Jesus, that we can be together. I do it for this reason, he says. <coughs> Excuse me, the fellowship of the brethren. In, in Psalm 133, 1, I love this. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is, guys, when we gather together for brethren to dwell together in unity. There's a unity. There's a one accord. And Paul's saying that. There's nothing like the fellowship of the whosoevers. If I speak to each one of you, you all come from a different place. You've all different ages, you know. We've got young people, old people, middle-aged people, old, old, old people like Tom back there, you know. We've got all these people. But guess what? We're gathered together in Jesus. That's where we're gathered together in, you see. He did it for the gospel's sake, that they would be partakers of it. Now, Paul's going to describe his attitude, how he does this all. And I love this, guys. He describes this as an attitude of an athlete, an attitude of somebody in a competition, right? I do it this way. Go on to verse 24. He says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, he says, but one receives the prize? You know, unfortunately, it's not that way today. It's everybody gets a blue ribbon. Oh, you tried. What's that to teach your children? Seriously, you don't teach your children that. You strive for better. Okay, I lost this time, but guess what? I'm going to run a little harder next time. I'm gonna, that, that boy with them long legs, I'm going to beat him, you know? So I, so I got a red ribbon or something. He says there, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run it such a way that you may obtain it, he says. You run, you run your tail off. And everyone who competes for the prize, he says, is temperate. Who's all those who are competing? There's a self control, right? In athletes, there's a self control. And that's what temperate means. He says, there is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, though. He speaks of a per perishable crown. He said, they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, see, he says, I run thus. This is how run, Paul says to run. Not with any uncertainty. Thus, I fight. Not as one who just beats in the air, but I disciple my body and bring it into subjection. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. You see, it began with servant, right? And then it ends with witness. Who are you in Christ? I love it. Paul says, I run. I fight, man. I run, I run, I run, I run hard. And I fight. I fight hard, too. I play to win. That's what he's saying. He's saying, man, I'm going to do this. I'm going to play to win. I don't just compete. Oh, well, I'm just one of those Christians sitting in a pew, raising my hands, saying I'm a Christian. Oh, look at me, you're Christian. No, he says, I'm going to run. I'm going to compete. I'm going to play to win. I'm going to win those whosoever's for Jesus. He has an attitude, guys. And he shares that attitude as an athlete. As in Paul's time, he could relate. They could relate to what he's saying here. Because sporting events were huge in Corinth. They were huge. It was arena competition. You guys ever watched the movie Gladiator? Something like that. All these different competitions they would have. Running competitions fighting competitions, all these things. And in Paul's time, it was huge, and so they could relate to him. Corinth was actually the center for the Ismayan, Ismayan Games. They were only second to the Olympics. By the way, yes, the Olympics were, came from way back then, and they were only second to that, and so they understood. People related to what he was saying there. 
This game, he says, I intend to win, period, period. I run, I fight. I intend to win it. How about us? How about us? Are you in it to win? Are we in it to win? People, or are we just in it to, well, I think I'll compete a little bit. I'll just compete. Do we run with resolve? Seriously. Do we run with resolve and, and a heart of a desire for others to know your Jesus? Do you run that way? You know, Philippians 3.14, Paul said, here's another terminology. He used many times in the Bible those things that pertain to sports, right? I press toward the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. I press towards this goal. I press towards this prize, right? Do we shoot for the goal? Do we help others maybe shoot for the goal or try to obtain the prize of our Lord and Savior? He says, I run, I fight, man. You know, my brother taught me to fight when I was young. And my brother took a Taekwondo karate. And my brother told me, he says, when you fight, you fight to win, brother. He says, he showed me how to make a punch connect. Paul's going to speak about that very thing here, believe it or not. He says, when you fight, you fight to win. Now, guys, I don't have to fight that way anymore, hopefully. <laughs> uh, but the fact of the matter is, he says, you do it with resolve. Are we running to win those whosoevers, fighting to win them, or just running with no goal? You know, Paul says, I press towards the goal for the prize, the upper call. Are we shooting for that goal and help others to the prize, amen? In verse 25, and everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, though, but we, as Christians, an imperishable crown— you have an imperishable crown, a non-decaying crown, because you're saved. You know, Paul's saying that they will compete for a temporal crown. Are we competing for the eternal crown, for others? That's what it's all about. In 2 Timothy, Paul wrote to 2 Timothy. I got to Timothy. Now, we don't even know if he received this letter before Paul was executed. He was in prison when he wrote this letter. And a good chance that he didn't, he didn't, the letter didn't get to Timothy until he was already executed. He says, finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me that on that day. And not me only, guess what, but also to all who have loved his appearing, to all who will push forward for the goal, he's saying. In verse 26, Therefore, he says, I run thus, not with any uncertainty, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats in the air, man. There should be no uncertainty in your race, guys. You're going to win. Do you understand? You got God, the Holy Spirit, within you. You're out there going to share your love with somebody. That just the hope of Jesus, you're going to win. Period. There's no uncertainty. He said, I'm not even worried about that. It shouldn't be any uncertainty to your race. You know, uncertainty to our race. Not beating in the air, you know. Making, making punches that don't connect. No. I'll tell you what. My brother taught me to fight. He says, that punches connect, each and every one of them. He says, you don't beat in the air. You see those movies. Uh, you, know. you know, you don't fight like that. You make them connect. Where do those punches hit? Boom, right in the heart. You understand? Paul's speaking about that. You fight, you connect with their heart, right? See, the whosoevers will know a fake Christian. My pastor would say, he was Italian. In, in Italian, it's fugazi. Don't be a fugazi, guys. They'll know the difference. A fake Christian. You know why? Because they've seen them before. Oh, they walked in the door before. They have all the time. Make your punches connect and hit them right in the heart. Have a certainty in your walk, a certainty in your faith. Know your Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart, mind, and soul, right? Have a certainty in that. Unshakable in all ways, important. 
In verse 27, Paul says, he says there in the end, but I discipline my body and bring it into submission, uh, subjection when I have preached, uh, I'm sorry, and bring it into sub, uh, subjection lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. That's so important. He says, I discipline for this race. I discipline for it. I discipline my own walk in Christ and who I am. I discipline as a Christian. You know, Christianity is all about discipline. You understand that? Discipline's good. You know, children love discipline. They love routine and they love discipline. They literally thrive on discipline. Unfortunately, the world's so white. You don't let your kid do anything they want. No. The Bible disciplines us in things, and that's what Paul's speaking about. This discipline. You have to uh, be able to know that the world is watching, church. Oh, they're watching us today, aren't they? Oh, yeah. Even in the political film. Who are these Christians? Wow, they must be the MAGA Christians, you know. They must be the ones who are, you know, they're, they're a right-wing kind of people. No, we love Jesus. And we know what the truth is. We know what a lie is. We know what is justice and what is not justice. That's what we know. Who are these Christians? The world's watching. If you're not different in the world, you are the world. If you walk the same, look the same, talk the same, everything is a world, you are of the world, church. You need to come to know the Lord. Where do we stand in that? John 2, 15, 16. Do not love the world. I have thrown this up on the screen so many times. If you don't have it memorized, ah, maybe we'll get little badges that says it on there. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it's not of the Father, but it's of the world. Don't be disqualified by things of the world, right? Jesus wants to use you. You know, don't shame the gospel that way. Don't shame your Savior that way. Let your life be disciplined. I know it's not easy. Guys, I'm a sinner too. You know that? I am a sinner most chief. I strive every day to draw and be more and more like my Christ. That's all I can do. So don't be disqualified. Now in closing, this might have sounded like a beat him up message, but I just want to encourage you Maybe you thought I was just beating you up, right? I hope there are some areas there you can, Holy Spirit's patting you on the back. That's, that's what I'm doing, Pastor. That's what I'm doing. You know, that's what the Word of God says. That's what I'm doing. I want to encourage you to run your race, guys. Run it. And grab on to those whosoevers. This place should be full. Seriously. We should have two services on Sunday. It should be full. There are so many hurting people out there. Do you understand that? They are hurting. They're lost. I guess the only thing stands between them not hurting and not being lost is their Lord and Savior. That's it. I just want to encourage you to run your race and grab onto those. Bring them into their race, right? It's always good to have new runners alongside you. And all oh, you're out striding them, you know. And you slow down a little bit. Let me show you how to really run, man. Let me show you how to really run. Follow me. Let me read you this scripture. Let me take you to a men's Bible study. Let me bring you on Wednesday night. Let me, you know, I'll help you run your race, guys. That they can all be winners in Jesus. Amen? Well, with all that said, maybe, just maybe, your heart was convicted. And maybe there's somebody here who doesn't even know the Lord. Have no idea what I was talking about, race and fight and all these things. I want to give you those opportunities. I want for those who want to be able to Maybe recommit your lives to sharing the gospel. Or for those who never have received Jesus, I'm going to pray here. Everybody bow their heads and close their eyes. And first off, if uh, you just want to run your race in a greater way, pray along this way. Say, Lord Jesus, I know you as my Lord and Savior, Jesus. I thank you that you shed your blood for me. Father, my race hasn't been so good. My fight for you hasn't been the best, Lord. Lord, help me. Discipline me in your word. 
Help me reach out to the whosoever's out there, God. Lord, to show them, to show them the true you. Lord, strengthen me in you. I give my life and recommit my life to that cause. And for those who don't know Jesus, just pray along this line. It's so simple. Just say, God, come into my life. Lord Jesus, pour your spirit into me. I believe in you. I'm a brand new Christian. I don't know anything. All I know is that I need a Savior, and you are that Savior, God. I give you my life right now, and I will, I will follow you, Lord. Put me in the race, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.